Welcome to the AGS Young Title Holders webinar, The State of the Diamond Industry with Martin Rappaport. Martin began his career in Antwerp, Belgium as a diamond cleaver in 1975. He established the Rappaport price list in 1978 and the Rapnet Diamond Trading Network in 1980. The Rappaport Group employs 230 team members all over the world, and we are so excited to hear from Martin and learn about diamonds in a time of disruption and rapid change. Welcome, Martin. Welcome. It's nice to be here, and I hope that everybody can hear me well. And if there's any problem with the presentation or anything, um, I'd like you to make sure you kind of uh, come in here and let me know so we can all see what's going on. I'm going to try to be a lot less formal than the state of the diamond industry presentation I usually make, but we will try to cover a lot of different ideas uh, in a short period of time. You may want to make notes about questions, and I will try to stop from time to time to see if, in fact, people agree or not. I don't know how you'll communicate back with me, but if there is the possibility of questions, we'll try to do it. If not, don't worry. Uh, we're going to communicate and have a lot of fun today. Um, first of all, let's see if we can actually move the screen here. Hang on a minute here. Okay, so we'll try the, uh, let's see if we can get this done properly. Here we go. All right. So first of all, what does the Rappaport Group do and stuff like that? I'm not going to give you a whole long spiel, but I will tell you that there's four fundamental areas of operation right now uh, in more plant. Information and research services. So we actually spend a lot of money trying to figure out what's going on. And that lets us do the Rappaport price list, a diamond grading and certification. We've been representing the GIA and, yes, now the AGS as well in Israel, Belgium, and India. I'm not sure the AGS is Belgium, but we handle a couple of billion dollars a year of diamonds coming in and out of laboratories. We run RAPNET, which a lot of you may know about, which is really amazing because it lists, uh, I don't know, about 1.3 million diamonds or maybe some duplicates, 1.1 million diamonds every single day. And they're worth about um, $7.7 billion. Uh, so that means it's about quite a bit of mostly certs, about 80% of J certs. So we're listing all these diamonds and we're making things happen. And I'll explain how, you know, what the philosophy behind that a little bit is. And then we do wrap trade, which is essentially a very sophisticated global brokerage service. And we do auction services with a lot of emphasis on recycling. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, we looked at the millennials. Now, I know that Millennials are important and they're there, but you know, I'm really an older guy and I'm like one of these baby boomers. And what occurred to me was to look at demographic data uh, actually about 15 years ago and to say, hey, you know, diamonds are forever, but people are not. Uh, diamonds are forever, but people are not. So the diamonds, there may be diamonds, more diamonds coming out of the United States and uh, say Florida, Nevada, other retirement states than South Africa. So Thinking about how people could get a fair deal and everything was very important to me. So what kind of runs us a little bit, and you need to understand that really the first thing I should say is that's the values and, and how we've survived. We'll be celebrating 40 years next year. It's about values. So whatever your values are, they don't have to be mine, um, but or our groups, I should say. Uh, but values, that's so important. So, and I'll explain why in the next slide. But basically, we are we go after what's ethical which means it's a little bit above the law. It's not just your legal. Transparent, competitive. So that's very powerful if you consider Expedia or RapNet, where not only you're transparent about what's available, but the diamonds are listed in, in the cheapest price first for the same quality. So it's like when you're using a kayak or something. So now that's very powerful. The combination of transparency and competitiveness <clears throat> is a very powerful force particularly in the internet world, and efficient markets. It's got to be efficient. No matter how good your ideas are, and no matter how strong your values are, if you're not efficient, um, you're wasting resources, you're disturbing the environment, you're not doing things correctly. So that's kind of an important thing. A secret of our success, um, creating, embracing, and actually surfing disruption. I mean, when I started publishing prices, it was disruptive, but since then there have been so many disruptions, whether it was the Yehuda treatment when it first came out decades ago, or whether it's synthetic diamonds today, or whether it's the way in which the internet interacts with human beings, you know, this whole communication world. So you've always got this disruption going on. And I love disruption. I surf it like a surfer. You know, some people swimming, you know, they may be disturbed by the waves and say, you know, I'm going to go swim in the swimming pool, not in the ocean. But I like the ocean. So I like surfing and it's fun. Uh, the other thing we do a lot of is market intelligence. We learn from the environment. Um, 
a lot of us get up every day and they go ping, 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 and you're doing a lot of pinging. I mean, not just on the internet, but in your life. You're constantly pushing things and promoting things. But maybe it's time to stop a little bit and get some pongs. So it's like ping pong. And when I say market intelligence, what I mean is that I'm actually picking up information from the ether, from the world around me. I'm aware. So if any of you guys, you have to do yoga, but even a little meditation, if you just sat there in a chair for a minute in your yard and you didn't do anything, just breathe, you'd start to become more aware of your environment around you. And that environmental awareness, and I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, the environment per se with, uh, you know, smog and stuff. I'm just saying being aware of everything around you, your relatives, your friends, um, what's important to you, and stuff like that. That's really important. And if you use it in the market, like we watch the diamond market, and you look at prices and availability and the types of people and the relationships, that's pretty cool. So that's what we do. And then the big thing is this culture of values. And, you know, if you want to have a successful business, and I've been going to a lot of these Harvard courses lately, um, you need to create a culture. If you want to have a good business, you want to be a good person even. And this culture is a culture of values. So when I mention those values, and I mention them again, ethical, okay, that's a culture. So if we uh, kick EGL off the rap net stage and, and we say, hey, you know, we don't think it's right, the EGL is real, specifically, whatever, you know, that's going to reduce our profits. So that means that you're making a value that is more important than making money. And if you want to define what is a value, you could say it's something that's more important than making money. So ethical takes you beyond the law. Okay, Transparent and competitive, that, that's an ethical value. It's also a value for our company. They yell at us when we go down with prices or they yell at us when we put more efficiencies and create disruption. But those are things that we believe in, and we believe in efficient markets. Now, efficient markets are kind of tricky because it doesn't mean we would support small companies against big companies. It doesn't mean we'd support independent retailers against, um, say, uh, you know, Signet or somebody. Um, and so, you know, we have to can, kind of look at efficiency rather than, you know, preferences. Now, there's an ethical story here, but think about efficiency. And think about how you really need to do the right things. One way to express this is to say that our company is a meritocracy. So we don't just hire people with their family members or something. Um, we give them a chance, but they, you, won't, you don't grow in the company unless you have merit, which means you're efficient. And having a value system that says you need to be a meritocracy is a pretty big thing. Okay? Especially for many of you who are in family businesses, I would imagine. All right. So what's the state of the diamond industry? What do we want to talk about here? And, you know, it's it's kind of I'm not going to talk that much about the other the, the, everything, but let me just lay it out. Retailer profitability in the Internet age. If you ask me what's the most important issue confronting um, the independent retailer, and I think a lot of the people listening to me here in this call are, in fact, independent retailers. So how can we make money? We got all this price of availability transparency. I mean, you got. Blue Nile, and you got uh, James Allen, and you got uh, all kinds of places where there's information flooding the world. It's like uh, almost like there's a um, a fire hose of information, you know, spritzing everybody with everything. But in any case, if you go specifically, if you hunt and search and peck, you get a lot of information on the internet. And so now the question is, how do we deal with this as a retail jeweler? And I'll talk about that. Radical political change. I mean, the president is amazingly different than the previous administration. I like both President Obama and I like President Trump because they are the presidents. And, you know, they represent something and maybe it's something what they represent you like or don't like. Um, but the fact is, whether you like President Trump or not, the fact that he's there creating all this radical political change it's going to affect economic uh, tax and trade policies. The question, what does that mean for the independent jeweler? What does that mean for you guys? Us guys, I should say. And source certification. This is a big issue because you need to know what you're buying and you're responsible for how you spend your money. And you'll see how millennials, other people relate to that. So these are the three things that I'm going to be talking about. Now, let me just give you a couple of numbers in the beginning, although I'm not really going to be super numbery today. What I'm telling you is that there's about $50 billion that is added value into the diamond industry, okay? Start your device and now, okay, fine. Uh, hopefully that won't bother me. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm saying that rough is like 15 billion, polished 20 billion, and polished what I'm talking about, the people actually cut the rough, um, you know, maybe some dealers as well in there. It's like $5 billion that we're running around for. Don't worry about the percentage, 33%, because, but I'll just explain. There's another $45 billion by the time the diamonds go from the diamond cutters, say, to the consumer. 
So the total ad value is about $50 billion. And then there's a question, who's more important? Are rough miners more important? Are polish cutters? Is who's getting their fair share? Don't look at the 225% diamonds and jewelry that you can make it because you got to pay for your store. You got to pay for your salesman. You got to pay for your showcases. You have all your costs. You also have to eat. So how many stores there are and how much more expensive it is. So this revenue stuff is cute, but we really should be looking at profit, which is much harder to relate to, but profit. You know, it's funny. Uh, you, know, you really need to think about why you're in business. And so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit too. Now, by the way, now we know that there's $50 billion. So this is retail here, okay? Um, and so the United States alone is 50, $41 billion, 51% of the market. So the American Jew is very important. Um, a diamond may travel the whole world. It could start off in Africa, go over to Antwerp, move over to India, go to Israel, then to a dealer in Chicago, and then to maybe you, a jeweler. But of all the thousands of kilometers that the diamond travels, and it does travel quite a bit, um, the most important distance that the diamond travels is the 18 inches across your counter. So did anybody tell you that retailers or jewelers, um, as I prefer to call them, aren't very important? You guys are really important. Because without those 18 inches, all the thousands of kilometers is for nothing. So to get your self-confidence, your self-worth up a little bit, everybody from the speech a little bit, okay? Because in fact, uh, this sector has got a $45 billion in it. I don't know, for, if, for half the market, it's got $22 billion or it's up $20 billion. There's a lot of problems, i got to tell you. But I'm going to mention problems today. But I want you to understand that the role of the jeweler is sacrosanct important for the positioning of the diamonds as the ultimate gift of commitment. You know, just understand that you're 51% of the world market, and you're going to see, I think you're going to grow. So how's business? These are like big numbers over here, but there's $4 trillion that the Americans spend in 2015 and 4.2. It grew by 4.3%. That's the purchase of all goods by all personal consumption expenditures. It's a pretty big number. And, you know, 1.7%, 1.7% is U.S. jewelry. U.S. jewelry went to $73 billion from $69 billion. And then this isn't diamonds, you know, this is like pearls and the colored stones and watches and you know, you name it. Now we grew by 5.9%, more than the general sale of US goods. So jewelry sales are growing faster than total retail sales. Consumers want jewelry more than other products, not all other products, but you know, we're up there. We're better than the average. So the want for jewelry, the desire for jewelry. Uh, to some degree, the passion for jewelry, it's there. So independent jewelers shouldn't feel like, oh, my God, I'm trying to do something impossible. Now, you may be trying to do something impossible because your business model isn't working at all. You know, like Amazon will kill you. You'll see that. Show. But the underlying demand for the product exists. People want to buy jewelry. So that should give you a little bit of confidence about, you know, what business are you in? Are you in a business that's dying? Are we all beating a dead horse here? Or is there really something that is driving jewelry demand and that people want to buy the stuff? So I'm telling you, people want to buy our stuff, our beautiful stuff, our sparkly stuff. Okay. So that's a good thing to remember as you look at some data. I mean, this even shows it better. What you're looking at here is retail sales. And uh, you can see they've gotten much bigger. Jewelry store sales. Look at that. Okay, they, they jumped up in November um, against retail sales in total. So this is the level of growth year over year. So 2016 showed us that people prefer jewelry. They bought more jewelry or the jewelry sector grew more than the regular demand for stuff, for, you know, regular retail stuff. So we're not in bad business, everybody. I had to do the business, I had to make money. That's another story. But the underlying business, total retail sales reached 4.9 trillion. Uh, 2%, 2.9% jump. So it was also jumping. So we went up a little bit more than they went up. Okay. And normally I would look out at the audience now and I'd have a really good sense of whether or not people understand what I'm talking about if I'm speaking too fast. So there is a moderator here who wants to give me a little word of assurance suddenly and say, hey, we're getting it. You're speaking. Okay. You can let me know. Uh, maybe my daughter, Panina, who's listening on this thing will text me on my phone. Now, just to finish some of the looking at this U.S. market, you know, the first half of 2016, which just ended pretty much, it's not ended yet, 
Um, it looks like sales declined for major jewelry retailers. I'm talking about the chains compared to the second half because they publish data on their sales. Um, but specialty jewelry stores, i.e. AGS guys, increased, which is good. I mean, we're taking market share. The, 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 uh, the specialty jewelry stores are taking market share from the big, you know, the big guys. Um, so, you know, our total sales were 31.43 billion uh, specialty jewelry stores. I guess that includes the whatever you sell over there and dishes or who knows what. But we uh, we increased by 3.8%. So not only is the underlying jewelry business good, but I'm pleased to inform you guys that the specialty jewelry sector of the jewelry industry is getting market share, it's taking market share from the Signets and the Sterlings and the whatever. Else. Yeah. Interesting point here also, and I'm giving you very selective little pieces of crumbs of data so you can kind of get a little feeling. Rough diamond sales increased by 37% in 2016. And that means it's to 5.6 billion, which means it's going to be more polished supply. But on the one hand, you're going to get more polished supply because of the rough and all that, but selective demand. I mean, people, people have become so picky. So there may be everybody chasing G to J, VS to I, one, you know, especially SIs, uh, eye clean SIs, if such a thing was ever to exist. You know, that stuff is good. And uh, people are going to be chasing those things all day long, especially as America grows. So we're in pretty good shape uh, in terms of, uh, I don't know, look at my thing, not 24. Okay. So we're in pretty good shape here in terms of, you know, there's going to be more goods. But now here's a good thing if you want to make money. Try to specialize in the types of diamonds that other people um, don't want, don't have, don't need. Um, and then you kind of get a niche in your town, in your village, in your community, in your world. And you say, hey, you know, I'm really doing, everybody's doing this. I'm doing uh, JVBSs or I'm a little better, you know, or you find something and doing pear shapes and, doing, you know, find some area also to specialize in so you really get some depth of market. And I don't know if you have to do this. I'm just saying I have seen merchandisers for the big guys, you know, hit up certain price points, characters, whatever. And they empty the market of that segmented piece of goods. Then you get some independent rulers say, oh, let me go and make something up with this kind of stone. And that stone is really not in the market because, uh, say, uh, you know, large chain has bought it all up. So just move around, you know, think about another color and clarity size combination that you can move. And if you get that, maybe that's a plentiful supply because the chains have been so specific about what they buy. So, you know, like a little hint to you guys is, uh, you know, go for the stuff that's available Think about the products that are available, maybe not just diamonds, colored stones, whatever. And, you know, and think about what you can make that you can go and, and do some good things with. So now I, I've spoken a lot about here, these numbers. You know, I don't want to kill you people with numbers. So but I'm going to talk about other things now. But you got a little bit of a background. Jewelry industry is good as jewelry. Um, the guys are taking market share from the uh, independence taking some market share. And you guys are in a pretty decent environment. Yeah. Leadership, you know, I've been spending some time, like I said, at Harvard and other places, and I'm trying to learn. I'm 65, right? and I'm trying to learn. So, um, the idea is leadership. What is leadership? How does it work? And, and this is something I wanted to share with the AGS young title holders, especially because, look, you guys, you're the you're the industry. You're the future. You're the guys. So when you think about what you're doing, uh, like I said, more, I want to hear more Pong than Japan all the time, you know, absorbing. You know, if, what you become what's what's going to happen to this industry? So essentially the industry is you. The future is you. And the AGS always took the high road and, and said, you know, we're going to have ethical people. We're not, we're going to do things in the right way. We're going to be, how should I say, the masters of legitimacy. So, you know, leadership and how you lead the industry and you lead yourselves is very important. So I thought I'd share a few points with you. First of all, there's a lot, a lot of, you know, really good AGS leaders, you know, and successful independent jewelers. Uh, they can provide advice. And I think that the advice part of life and interfacing with other people, particularly in the AGS, is a good idea. So I encourage everyone, you know, it's not like only one mentor, but hang out with people, uh, not just at the AGS conclaves, which everybody should go to, obviously, but, you know, just have beer together. I'm, I'm watching what's going on in the IT development uh, sector of Jerusalem. Yes, I live in Jerusalem, Israel, and we do have a huge, a huge it's very small, but a rapidly growing uh, IT sector doing all kinds of, uh, you know, new startups, you know, startup craziness here. So in any case, people get together. They, you know, we, what we do is every Thursday night, we go out and we have a beer and a pizza right here in a good place. And, you know, so the idea is that everybody's going around. So interface with people, learn from others, learn from your peers. 
I mean, you you could probably learn more from your friends or the people who not your friends only. I mean, people who are your peers. Okay, you don't have to be your friends, but they're people who are involved in industry. And you know, this uh, this young uh, this young uh, presidents club or something. Uh, very good idea. Of course, is like at Harvard, the J has something. Hanging out with your peers. They could be older and younger. Okay, education. That's what you need to really spend time on. Never stop. And self reflection. And self reflection is that more pong. You're pinging. Do some ponging, you know, look at yourself, inside yourself. You're going to find what you need to really make good the, the strategic decisions and value decisions. So do that. Empower others. This is a big one in terms of running companies or if any of you are, in fact, managing other people. Empower others to advise you. I mean, you don't have to take and say, I'm empowerment. Here it is. Run with the ball. You know, see you next year. You can say, listen, I want to keep continue making decisions because you do people advise me. So you talk to people and you say, I'm not going to make a decision about this subject before I don't get and consider your opinion. And whatever you can go with that. But you can also give a, you can also give people the right to make decisions. And if you do that, you have to implement policies and procedures. Because if you just help people make decisions and you don't give them any uh, boundaries about what they can decide, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. So you want to have policies and procedures that govern how people uh, make decisions that you empower. And finally, make decisions quickly, efficiently, and singularly. And by singularly, I mean that you are the guy responsible. Whoever is responsible is responsible. This idea that everybody sings kumbaya and no one is responsible, evil, bad, don't do it. If whoever makes the decision, and it's okay if you make a lousy decision, that's all right, learn from it. But you got to have that. So I thought I would give you a few words about a leadership. Big thing here, have fun. I, you know, it sounds crazy, but if you ask me, one of the main things about the success of our company is that I and we and we believe in fun. Now, I mean, we're not as crazy as uh, Zay. Was, what's the name of that store in uh, in Las Vegas who does the shoe thing? I, you, I'll bring them up later. We're not as crazy as they are, but we're pretty, you know, have fun. The greatest blessing is when the what you love to do, okay, Zappos. Yeah. Okay, the greatest blessing is when one's passion, what you love to do your talent, what you can do. Now, I want to be a great singer, but God, that person sees it sounds terrible. You know? So you have to have the passion and the talent, and you have the ability to merge it into your work. So like if you were one of the greatest piano players in the world, but you were born in Sierra Leone and you never saw a piano, you would never have that opportunity to be amazingly in touch with your God-given talents and abilities and passion. So anyone who's in this kind of independent jewelry business or whatever, you know, you got to think about that. You got to think, is this what you're passionate about? You know, do you love what you're doing? Uh, those that enjoy their work work better. That sounds interesting, but it's really true. Um, and they, they're more productive. You know, self-confidence, they get self-confidence based on success is one of the most powerful things in the world. You wake up, you did something, it worked. You know, oh, good, I feel great. I can do more. And that's the energy you want to generate. Work is really growth, and it's got to be interesting. Now, I see this with millennials a lot, and they're smart about that. You know. Work isn't just work, it's growth, it's development, it's it's the whole person's life as well. It has to be interesting, it has to be challenging, um, it has to be stimulating, you know, challenging, stimulating, and it has to be rewarding, and you gotta pay when you want to be able to do things, but it has to be fun. And and so when you're doing your stuff and you're thinking that you ask, you're looking at your watch 10 times a day, and you should be doing something else, you know. Uh, if you're if you're having fun and you don't really realize, you know, the day is gone, and you say, Wow, where did that day go? You know, that's pretty good, and then you're getting in the game. Okay, so I wanted to share this with you guys. Now, as I wanted to give it to you a little bit, this is a book by, um, oh, how can I forget his name? Hopefully it'll be in here somewhere. But the first thing is I want you to draw a circle which you're really passionate about and you can do like you're talented with. Then draw another circle which you can be the best in the world. Now, I say best in the world. You can be the best diamond engagement ring seller in Poughkeepsie. That's fine. You're the best in the world at that thing that you've identified, right? And then show me where you can make money. Show me the money. Because if you're having passion and you're best, but you can't make any money doing this, no one is willing to vote for you to reward you with any money, then you're no good. So you're not sustainable. Okay. So now, if you can get these three things together, I just cannot remember the name of the book. If anybody knows the name of the book, let me know. And Panini, you can text me or whatever it is. But the bottom line is, it's a really great guy. It's good to great is the name of the book. Collins, Jim Collins. Yes. Good to great. Jim Collins. Great book. Wonderful. And, you know, I got a couple of things out of it. I mean, I didn't get everything out of the book. That, you know, I don't agree with everything. Right? But this three circles, powerful, very powerful. And this is for you. It's for your business. You know, it's for your life. And you could look at it, the world this way and say, where's my little triangle? Where is my home? Where should I be dancing? 
you know, so this is a great way to think about things in terms of yourself, in, in terms of, you know, leadership, in terms of the things we were talking about until now. All right, now let's get into something that's a little tougher. And uh, I would love to say to the group, everybody with me so far? Hey, Panina, send me a little text. Tell me how I'm doing so I know where we are. We're approximately, we're not yet halfway there, but we're moving along. Um, so thinking about retailer profitability, which is, I think, a very good subject for us to be talking about. So the rate of change is increasing. Now, Alvin Toffler said this in the 70s. He said, you know, when you went from, you know, the invention of the car, the locomotive, and then the jet airplane. That's a big jump. The jet airplane is much better than a train or whatever. So the, the bottom line here is that, um, the bottom line is that this rate of change thing, it's gone nuts. You know, it, it's affecting everything. You, you can't wake up in the morning and something new hasn't happened. I'm not talking just about terrorist attacks, I'm talking about technology and, and the way we communicate with each other as people. You know, when I came to Israel, um, and that had to be in the first trip I made. It was when I was in university, 16 and a half, 17. There were no phones. If you wanted to meet a girl, you went over and you knocked on her door, literally. And there were no phones. People didn't have phones. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have no phones. And they had radio, no television. So the whole way people communicated and interacted was unbelievably different. And so we've seen this now where we like electronic beings with virtual realities or stuff. But anyways, rate of change, external change. Now, let's say you're in the diamond business. And the taxes change. You know, I don't know. President shows up with a helicopter, throws hundred dollar bills out the window. Okay, that's an external change. Um, things like synthetics technology affecting us externally, tax policy, all kinds of things are happening around us. How good the economy is doing. Okay, and then there's internal change. Maybe again synthetics, things that are happening within the industry. Uh, the prices of rough go up. Um, we have a problem about synthetic diamonds infiltrating into parcels of melee, you know, things that are happening inside. One thing we should remember is the only thing consistent is change. So whenever you're sitting in a horse, you know, that horse, I wouldn't say he's going to die, but the horse is going to go fall in love with another horse and leave. So everything's changing. And just get used to change, you know, just become comfortable with it if you can. So what's the big issue? Can independent retail jewelers survive in the Internet age? Will we be Amazoned? Hmm. You could say we'll be Amazoned, okay? But will we be Amazon? You know, what are we doing? And if we're not going to be Amazon, why won't we be Amazon? I mean, they're great. You call them up, you get the thing the next morning, you you can give it back, you you don't pay for shipping, you're the prime thing. You know, and it's not just Amazon. I mean, we've had threats all along. Uh, consider Costco, and there's a new war developing between Amazon and Costco. So the idea here is that Costco doesn't have to make any money when it sells you diamond jewelry. They don't have to make any money. Why? Because they have all these membership fees that give them so much money for the membership fee, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, that they can say, okay, I buy a diamond, I make it into a ring, uh, I mark it up 6%, 8%, 12% maximum, and I throw it out there. By the way, they use, I would call it an I, you know, VS one and a you know, VS two and a half plus or something like that. Now, the point is that you're sitting in a world where other people are disrupting the whole distribution system, and they're going after your customers. Now, one way to look at this is that Amazon is out there doing all this, and other people are doing. Costco's saying I don't have to make money. Now they're fighting with each other for market share, and you know, God, heaven knows, so they'll be selling the diamonds below cost. But forgetting about that for a little bit, and let's look at that word of Amazon. <laughs> I think of it, AMA zoned. Does Amazon have any limitations as to what they do? Oh yeah, they don't. They don't. I mean, there's a big difference walking into a jewelry store, a professional jewelry store, and dealing with Amazon. It's different. Now, whether it's better or not, I'm not so sure. So we have to question that. Can jewelers transcend Amazon? Can you find things that we can do that are things that Amazon doesn't do that people are willing to pay for? Again, I'll say that, you know, can we find things that we can do that Amazon doesn't do, all those low cost distribution networks doesn't do. And that thing that we can do can make us money. And when I say make us money, I mean that the thing that we're doing, if it's a, you know, shut the showroom and it's trying on the rings and talking to the person and making them feel comfortable and taking care of the relationship between the guy and the girl so she can hint to you what she wants and he doesn't understand. And you do all the stuff. And is that worth money? And is the cost of doing all that 
handling extreme customer service, is that cost um, worth it in terms of the value that the customer is willing to pay was more than your cost? And, that, and that's really, if I talk to you about creating value, and I'll talk about that, it's really about doing something, adding value or creating value is a better way to think of it, um, that you can make more money from than it costs you to do. You know, it's, that's the game. Very simple. So, you know, where do we have this? We have, you know, maybe you have a physical showroom experience, but, you know, you know, Tesla and Blue Nile, which are both internet sales, you can't buy a Tesla off a lot. You go to the computers and you, they show you a model and you, I don't know when they have secondhand Teslas, maybe we'll make a market for them, but right now you don't buy those things, only online, same way with Blue Nile. So they're opening showrooms. So this whole physical showroom experience looks like it's up for grabs and what it means and how it works. And then I was thinking about other things that are not really the normal story, like emotional, electronic friendship. You know, I, it's pretty easy for a jeweler to sell a diamond engagement ring to someone that went to school with them for 12 years, okay, or whose families are extremely close friends. You don't need a PhD for that. If everybody can come your friend because now you have this internet what they do, then, hey, that's pretty cool. So now you can... Um, you can kind of really be friends with people, real friends, like me university maybe. Uh, I don't know how that works exactly, but there's so much social media friendship going on. Um, and maybe if you just meet them once, then you can really enhance the relationship. But I want you to understand that the idea of extreme customer service, which people have been thinking is the um, only domain available, you know, to retail jewelers, you know, you got to look at the Zappos extreme service model and see what they're doing. Um, and, you know, hang on to your pants because Zappos is owned by Amazon. But Amazon hasn't disrupted their extreme customer service environment. And it's leading the way in terms of what Amazon is doing. They're buying all these other people who do things in different ways so that they can capture the broad rainbow, the broad range of retail experiences that consumers want. I'm going to play a video for a few minutes. Uh, it's going to take two and a half minutes. Okay. I hope it'll work. And this will show you what I mean when I say that the experience of uh, the, the customer service, whatever it is, the experience, okay? It's becoming uh, somewhat different. So have a good time watching the video. Engagement rings are a danger. <coughs> Tread carefully. I think it would be fun to put him to the test and see, like, you better know, you know? <laughs> what he this. comes up with. I got this. <laughs> All right, Panina informs me that you can't see the video. So we're going to move along over here. And when technical people come back to me, they should maybe be in touch with uh, however they can communicate with me here. Well, I'll put the video back on, okay? And if she can't see the video, I have to assume other people can't, and I don't want to waste your time. Uh, what does it say? It's good now. All right, fine. Engagement rings are a danger. Tread carefully. I think it would be fun to put him to the test and see, like, you better know, you know, <laughs> I got what this. he comes up with. I got this. I have high hopes about this. I think I'm going to rock your world, babe. All right. Design your own engagement ring. Start with the setting. It is very important to me that he gets this right um, because it's something that I have to wear for the rest of my life. He's really confident about, like, everything, so. He's going to be like, I nailed it. Go big or go home, right? The yellow gold. 18. No, uh, I'm going to assume that's 18 carats. Probably thinks I'm going to choose like a five carat crazy diamond thing. Engagement rings are like five year salary, right? Something that feels like it is a little bit vintage looking would be awesome. I have to be confident in my choice. I told her I was going to rock her world. Add your diamond to a ring. Choose a setting. Obviously, we're doing yellow gold. Choose a diamond. What is all this? That looks like an algebraic equation. All right, I'm just going to look at this one close up one more time. Oh, you can see what it looks like on someone's hand. It's my final design. Round 0 0.76 carats. Cushion outline pave engagement ring. I'd say yes to that. I'm ready. One, two. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay, all right. They're not that different. No. So I picked a vintage set. I like vintage too. Wow. But what, what made you want to give me that, to do your bet ring like that? 
Um, that. <laughs> that right there. Oh, it's a ring. <laughs> like it looks like a crown and like Sarah a princess. Oh, <laughs> how much is it? No. Hey, how is yours? <laughs> Wait. Wow, yours is way more expensive than the one I chose. She held back. So I'm looking at the price of the diamond. Look I'm not even band. looking at the price, actually. The price is not really a big deal to me, to be honest. Look that's not, look that's not, band. I'm just surprised that I was that. Look oh. at the, look at the. Uh, you are not serious. Baby. That's what I picked out. No, that's a joke. That is all the way something I did not predict. It's nice. You, I mean, definitely worth it. If she likes it, if she wants it, then she gets it. She knows that. She's the queen. That's the way it's always been. Okie dokie. So, I hope you guys can still hear me now. We haven't messed everything up. Um, let's see if I can jump back to my little world here. So, this idea of an experience. And these people didn't just buy it, you know, walk into a store or click on something at Amazon and get it shipped to them. This is a whole thing going on here. And this idea of how they've been they're communicating it, okay, um, and then the way that they're communicating what the product is and the experience. So, you know, like if we understand millennials, and I, I really not qualified because I've got so many millennials I'm speaking to, that hopefully I'll resonate with you guys. Um, you know, you want experiences. I think the millennials want experiences. Everybody wants experiences now. Um, and, you know, want to have a fun experience getting an engagement ring. And that was a fun experience getting an engagement ring, all this customization. They don't want to customize everything to, to the limit of craziness, but they want to be able to kind of play Lego, okay, get pieces and put them together. And the make ring is like totally doing that. And they, the other thing that you didn't see, but I don't even know if they, James, I don't know if these people do it, is the extreme customer service. But that's what millennials want. They want experiential. They want to be able to customize something a bit, not too much. And they want to have extreme customer service, which is the thing with the, you know, the, the, the shoe store, the, you know, those guys. They got it down to extreme customer service, which is available online. So this internet thread isn't something that we should just ignore. It's, it's sort of like biting off a piece of the market and saying, I'm going to own this because I'm going to be so efficient. I'm going to be so transparent. I'm going to be so competitive and hopefully ethical. So this idea of experiential customized extreme customer service, you know, is really, really important. You got to create desire. Okay, uh, transcend the product to the consumer. I mean, that's really important. Forget about what you're selling. It doesn't matter. You are really kind of helping that person realize an experience to customize, you know, whatever it is. So think beyond the idea of the product and think about what the customer wants. And that's the whole total. I mean, we had this in the magazine. Okay, fine. Now, millennial expectations. I'll run through this pretty quickly. Time is moving, you know, pretty rapidly here. Um, you know, social circle. Is your brand part of a consumer's close social circle and social circles are more than just a Facebook page. It's like all web of interactive, you know, communications. Self, does your brand have an emotional connection with your customer? I, you know, it's a brand. So they're talking about brands here. It's a cool Mark Bell's book. So to, does your brand have this capability and all that stuff? So this emotional connection is you loving your customer or having a relationship trust. Does your brand put the customer's needs first? Are you willing to sacrifice money? And I'm not talking about your margin. I'm talking about doing things that are more important than money. Say you're socially responsible and you know where your diamonds come from. And you pay more for them. So. Innovative is your brand is constantly changing. When I said before that the only thing constant has changed, right? Purposeful. Um, what good do you do? Are you doing more than just yourself? Are, are all jewelers selfish people who charge high markups and stuff? Or do they give back to the community? I know the AGS people give back to communities. It's great. But the product itself you know, and like, you know, my son, Shimshon, I think he's taking over for Sierra Leone next Monday or Tuesday. And we're looking at what's going on there with the Development Diamond Initiative and trying to understand the life of these diggers. So, you know, how much involved are you? Are you using diamonds to help people at all? Okay. Um, and where your diamonds come from and all that, obviously, we're going to talk more about. And convenient. I mean, come on. I can sit there and play around with diamond engagement rings, you know, in my pajamas at, at three in the morning if I feel like it. That's really convenient. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the negative, saying, okay, how convenient is it in your store and all that, but I'm just saying to you, these are what people expect. You know, that's like the starting gate, okay? Um, now, the challenge is like the Amazon effect millennial time. And they're going after millennials, and they're using all the research and all the uh, deep data mining and all that stuff 
you know, easy, convenient, fast, unlimited selection. That's the mobile gap. Yeah, mobile is funny because what we're finding out is that it doesn't close a sale, but it connects, which means right now when you think about what you're in the business of, you actually have two businesses being in. One business is to connect with people and the other business is to sell your products or whatever. If you don't connect, you're not going to probably, I mean, everybody's doing the mobile connecting, like, you know, or internet connecting, what, 90 something percent of everybody who's buying occasionally, they're going to check out online. They're going to look for something like kayak. With. So computers are browsing on their smartphones, but they're not closing deals. They see the diamond is more impressive, important, whatever. So then they, they go to the web page. So the mobile app conversion levels are only one third of what's happening in web pages. The big thing we're seeing also is brand selling directly to consumers, you know. So I'm not even talking about a situation where um, you have people like the beers doing the forever mark, which is an interesting brand to consumers through retailers. I mean, brands going direct, boom. Coming up with consumer products, you know, selling consumers direct, owning all these websites. So we have to look at that. Uh, with the growth of online shopping, brands are selling to pay bypassing the retailer. So that's this 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 intermediation thing. So look at what I said is disintermediation is really cutting out profit centers. So if there were five people that handled the diamond before it went from the diamond manufacturer to the jeweler or the retailer, even retail, now there's three. Okay, so we're, what we're seeing is that all this information and availability and pricing and not just that, the delivery system, you know, I, when I first heard that Amazon was going to um, thinking about using these little flying machines, uh, you know, to deliver packages, I thought they were totally crazy. But now I'm seeing what they're doing with two-hour delivery sometimes in New York City, and you know, they're keeping to growing. They're, they're, they haven't even begun, you know, to do all the stuff they're going to do. So this idea of delivery, instantaneous delivery, very powerful. So we're cutting out people, um, and now this. This concept of the miners sell consumers, the manufacturers sell consumers, the retailers cut out, go to miners, the Tiffany owned mines. Okay. You know, it works both ways. And, and you know, people sourcing on Rapnet from Surat. And then, you know, so all this kind of jumble of new lines, new relationships. Will miners eventually go to consumers? That's an interesting question when, you know, the beers bought back their brand. I'm not talking about forever. I'm talking about the De Beers brand, which was a consumer brand. So I don't know. And I think that it's a free market. And I think people are going to do things. Now, just because a guy knows how to mine diamonds does not mean that he knows how to sell a consumer. So I'm not so worried that everything's in the middle is going to be gobbled up. But this is going to drive us to this point of, okay, what do you do as retailers that a mining company can't do or doesn't do? Hey, the other big point I wanted to mention is about the disruption thing is that we're going to brands the way, you know, watches product uncertainty. Like, I don't know what this diamond is, where it came from. Oh, it's a brand. It's Tiffany or it's, I don't know, XYZ Jewelers. It's AGS Jeweler, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's important to me to know who is this person? What is this? And you want to do, you know, like consolidated marketing. What, what if the brand is you can't spend, you know, $50 million uh, supporting a, a certain brand of uh, jewelry, say even diamond jewelry, hard supplier for you. But if you got a lot of jewelers that are selling it, you know, then you can consolidate the marketing into a branded messages that gets the consumer's attention, that promises the consumer stuff. A brand is a promise, okay? Promises those consumers authenticity, don't worry about the synthetics, promises them ethical, you know, don't worry about blood diamonds and stuff like that. So when you start talking about brands, uh, being able to consolidate their marketing, you understand. So you can ask a question, is Forevermark going to be the new Rolex? Okay, is that and it's funny because I had done this in the Vegas uh, thing, and then he came by the head of Forever and said to me, you know, hey, yeah, you, it's exactly what I'm trying to do. Now the idea of the new Rolex it means also that watches, you know, if, if we want to understand maybe where diamonds are going, maybe maybe you know we can learn from what's happened to watches. We can see that watches went from, you know, you don't have a no name watch. No one can show me a watch that doesn't have a brand name on it. If it's Casio for nine dollars, it still has a name on it. So you need to think about this idea of branding yourself. And will diamond jewelry go the way of watches? And if it does, then you at least can start predicting, you can start understanding what's going on in a massively changing environment. I'm um, slide 23, and it's like you know, time's moving. I want to talk more about disruption. And look at the example of Payless versus Zappos. Uh, Payless just closed 512 stores a few weeks ago. And they're a traditional shoe seller for many years. Zappos, which is this, you know, crazy, and when I say crazy, I mean crazy customer service oriented space, um, they're up to $2 billion. You know, their projected profit is 97 million, up 77.9%. So how's Payless doing versus Zappos? 
Zappos is killing them. We're not even killing them. They're, they're literally, <laughs> pun the joke, stepping on them. And that's it. They're gone. Now, look at Blue Nile. Blue Nile takes, yeah, Bain takes two Nile's private for $500 million. I don't know why they were worth $500 million, but bingo. James Allen gets $140 million for 50%. So these guys can take all this money. They're going to be spending it chasing your customers. Okay. And they're going to be using the technology and all kinds of ways to do things. So we have to really, you know, we got to sharpen up as independent tours. Brilliant Earth also is opening showrooms, doing things, pushing the uh, envelope on ethical sourcing. Now, what do we do about this? I wouldn't leave you just the challenges and problems, hopefully. So here's some heavy stuff. Okay. Profit is really dependent on value creation. If you create value, when I said value, I meant you do something where the money people are willing to give you is more than it costs. Okay, so profit equals added value minus the cost of creating the value. Very straightforward. Now, the way that you make such profit is through value creation. That's what you got to think about. How do I do value creation? Now, what is value? Value gives you an equation. Value is quality divided by price. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But quality includes the entire bundle of what's being sold. So if your quality of product, say, includes a showroom, a beautiful store, someone that talks to customers, reminds people about their birthdays, you know, really kind of interfaces with the customer in many ways, or you're a great designer like JAR, or you're doing whatever you're doing. Okay, so that's like part of the quality. So when I give you this equation of value, this quality divided by price, I'm also talking about the entire package of your added value story. So V is value equals Q divided by P. So for example, let's say you're selling something for $1,000, and now you put in a better quality stone. Before it was, I don't know, a KI one, now it's a JI one. So great, the person got more value. You understand that. And the same way, if you decrease the price for something, you're giving the person more value. If you increase the price, less value. So think about this idea of the relationship between the quality and your price, and it has to be. Good because if your price is too high, you know, then it's no good. So if you're giving someone a wonderful in-store shopping experience, but you're charging, I don't know, 40, 50, 60, I don't know how much you're charging for that for an engagement ring, for example, you know, that's like, you know, you might be giving low value relative to someone who's charging something else or relative to Blue Nile or something. Now you could say, well, I'm doing something different than Blue Nile. And that was the AMA zone, you know, is Amazon zoned into only a certain area of activity so you can create new value beyond anything that those other low price people do. Now, your queue is different. So if you can grow your queue, if you make your queue really big because you're really giving people what they want and they love you and they just want to buy by you, you could probably increase your price and maintain the same value. So this relationship between what you do in terms of added value and your price, that's really key to understanding your competitive space and ultimately your profits. You show me someone with a high V, and I'll show you someone that's going to make good profits. Now, this internet stuff, obviously price transparency, but, you know, this it's educating people. It's interfacing with them. It's getting the first bite at them, if you want. Um, how we communicate is it's, it's, like, so amazing. It's like a whole culture of things. So, you know, you really – it's very confusing, you know, to get your messages and stuff. And anybody can communicate with anybody. Everybody can communicate with consumers. In the old days, a consumer is walking down the street, walks into your store, they want to buy jewelry. But today, you can creep up the guy's jewelry demand because you know that uh, his girlfriend uh, was on uh, uh, the knot uh, looking at uh, their wedding dresses. Uh, so, uh, you know, you got like a three-month, uh, you know, note before – the person is actually going uh, to get engaged. So they got a three month period there to talk to her, talk to him, find out who he is, find out who she is. You know, all this direct relationship is running thought leadership. And by the way, when you understand what thought, you know, what this inbound marketing is, thought leadership is people in your community look up to you and say, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. Segmentation, the people that you're interfacing with, you know who they are. You know, you're not trying to sell steak to vegetarians. So you say, okay, these are the golf club guys, you know, these are the golf coaches, these are the people who are university professors, you know, different kind of people. And you understand everybody who you're dealing with, and you people should be people you decide not to deal with. Once you decide what your segmentation is, who you want to deal with, you, you engage when you send them emails, or they send you, you call them, you meet them at a party, you, you play golf with them, I don't know. You interact with them, and then you get to acquisition. So it's really thinking about the person more than the product. And that's the big point I'm giving you today is that you want to really transcend the product to the person. 
So innovation is coming along, new communications technology. I don't know, come on next year they'll have uh, ping pong instead of, uh, I don't know, whatever new thing they have, disruption. How you meet, greet, help, and sell to the, the, the customer. You know, this innovation is, is changing that whole relationship. Segmentation, which I just explained to you, is you know not only you have to segment the people, like this guy's the golf guy, this guy's the professor guy, whatever. You got to segment which products are suitable for which people. And then you need to think about how am I going to let that person know? I don't think I'm going to send an email to someone who is a millennial, you know, especially a younger one. I'm going to you know deal with them on Facebook or some other way. So if you if you if you with the wrong communication channel and you got a good business. You're going to go out like the fax machine went out. Who has a fax machine now? Once it was great technology. It was super. But now, you know, forget about it. Uh, so you got to be able to, you know, segment your people, your products, your communication channel. And I would say to you, segmenting products is about curation. You're an expert. You understand a good ring from a bad ring, a good design from a bad design, a class that's definitely going to break. You know what you're selling. You know the product. But now you have to understand that to the consumer, it's like a fire hose into a teacup, you know, forget about it. So you come in there and you do curation for you knowing your customer, knowing the products they like. So you sell steak to meat eaters, you make a beautiful salad for vegetarians, you know, and you know exactly what to sell to whom and how to communicate with them because the whole thing is communication. So this you understand. So you got to identify your value creation opportunities. You got to segment, then curate. You got to hire and empower young people. You got to hire women, lots of women. Women love Julie. They're passionate. Not all women, okay? And lots of men are passionate too. So I'm not just only up saying I expect to see more women in the diamond and jewelry sector. And you got to treat your team well, you know, because they got to provide the extreme customer service that I told you millennials demand, expect. So, so you know, hire young people and then you know, I'll learn from them. And and uh, and you got to make sure that your 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 team. If you want to have extreme customer service, you have to have extreme human resource relationships with your people. You know, I don't know if you have to do foosball, but maybe you should take everybody out for foosball or bowling night or whatever it is. You need to build the team. You need to build the chance for people to learn from each other. So evolve from price and product competition to online communication competition. It's all about getting the customer online. If you ask me. The challenge and opportunity and money is in customer acquisition. Get to know your customer. Love your customer. Now, the sales is a byproduct of the relationship you made with your customer. And that's how I think of it. Now, maybe I'm wrong, by the way, but this is my view. Uh, so you are the Internet. You yourselves, every one of you, just dance with that Internet. Use the Internet. See, that's what's so great. I don't think Signet or, or any of the big chain stores have any advantage over the personal jeweler who has a relationship and he has personality and communicates and, and he's a real person or she's a real person and they're fun to be with. You know, you, you kill the, the, the big chains and it's not about the product, it's about the experience of the relationship. Communicate who you are and how you can help people get what they want. They want jewelry, whatever they want, okay? I don't think you have to start walking their dogs, but you know, you gotta really understand what the your customer wants and where your expertise lies. Don't be a product pusher. Everyone hates product pushers now. Um, segment, I, I, I'm here to help you whatever you want kind of person rather than buy this brain. Segment everything and everyone and how you communicate, which I said three times already. So you're not just segmenting the people, you're segmenting the products and you're sending how you communicate. Recognize we live in a multi-channel communication. world. you the right channels, communicate the right, uh, this one, communicate the right curated products to the right people at the right times. And I'm running late almost, so I will touch on. So right now we talked a lot about, you know, your business and you and what my thoughts are, and I hope that you find this helpful. I'm going to touch on a few things very briefly here. Politics, tremendous focus uh, on U.S. jobs is going to be coming, um, although we're at a pretty high employment level. And it looks to me like we're going to have a $1 trillion fiscal stimulus. So I said about President Trump, a helicopter throwing $100 bills out the window. Well, not exactly, but not not exactly. So there's going to be a lot more money flowing into the U.S. Uh, the U.S. tax policy, dropping taxes, that's going to be amazing. And I don't have time to discuss that. Don't worry about it. Probably won't happen. But, you know, hey, there's going to be more money in America, so America's going to grow. Made in America should become something. We're going to deal with that. We're going to do that. We have to figure it out, okay? Uh, compliance. Terrorism is more common. Governments believe that controlling the flow of money, hey, what are they trying to do? They're trying to choke the terrorists out of their money. It's kind of weird because I guess for like, I don't know, 100, 200, 500,000 dollars, you can mount the terrorist attack. And 500,000 dollars, I don't know what it is. Uh, let's just say a 10 carat D flow is $2 million. You know, how much is a you know, 
that's not a lot of money. So you can control the money to that extent, but that's what's going on. They're squeezing the terrorism by controlling the money. So um, not just money. Diamonds are the same thing in terms of the Patriot Act. Banks are sitting tight in the flow of money. You know, they got billions, billions, not millions, billions of dollars of fines. So everybody's squeezing money and then it's moving. U.S. Patriot Act regulations apply to diamonds. So if you're dealing in diamonds, now I don't know, the laws are different if you're selling consumers and you're only a retailer. So the Patriot Act might not apply to you, but there's OFAC lists. Now, you have to be responsible for what you're buying and you need to make sure that there's an issue here about where you're getting your diamonds from. And if you don't know, you know, that's problematic. So all of this is pushing us to source certification. Big idea is that we're starting to look and say, can we identify where this polished diamond came from? Can we trace the rough? You know, they do this with timber. They do it with fish. They do it with, you know, it's possible to trace things in this new electronic world that we're in. So uh, brands, you know, can you imagine you have a brand and they, they come out and they say, hey, you know, the diamonds you're selling came from a war in the Congo, you know, it's going to be disastrous for the brand. So you, you're you're more exposed with the brand. And I want to tell everybody, all the people on the school, each of you individually are a brand. Your store is a brand. Think about everything as a brand. So anyways, the risk to brands by selling a bad product. I mean, look what happened with all that unfortunate story with Signet, where they said they were switching. They weren't switching. You know, terrible. Really hurt their stock. So it hurt their reputations. So got to be careful what you're doing here because you are a brand, whether you realize it or not. Now we're moving to a world where known money, known people, you can't say who you sell to, trade known diamonds, diamond, we know where it came from, source certified, with known money. You can't walk up to a bank and say, he's got a million dollars in my suitcase, I want to open an account. They won't do it. They'll ask you where the money comes from. So this known business is definitely happening in the supply chain, and you need to be aware of it because you should really be responsible. The big idea is that all of us, from rough buyers to consumers, are responsible for what we buy and sell responsible for where our money goes. So if there's a bad guy in Africa that sells a diamond to a diamond manufacturer in Israel, say, and then that diamond manufacturer then sells the polished diamond, and, you know, in the cutting of the rough to the creating of the polish, somehow the bad smell gets lost. But that money might go to some bad guys. It's just Israel, India, Belgium, New York. I'm not looking at one specific center. So purchasing power requires responsibility to ensure the legitimacy of our products, and this is a very strong millennial value. It's not just a millennial value. It's a realistic value because you do not want to be supporting terrorism. It's just wrong. It's not ethical, let alone the fact, God forbid, you know, you can have a, you know, some same terrible. I want to talk about it. So if I look at supply chain certification, which is something that's going to be popping out of everybody's radar, think about all the different things pointing in the same direction. The threat of synthetics. Yeah, I want to know where my name would come. Bank regulations, law enforcement, government regulations. The law enforcement is tougher than government regulations, but corporate responsibility with brand threats, socially conscious consumers, and then ethical competition. My diamond is better than your diamond because it's triple X and triple VG. Okay. But my diamond is better than your diamond because it's got source certification. So yeah, people are going to be you know, doing those kind of communications. I'm almost done here. My daughter is calling me. I don't know what she wants, but we'll see. I don't know what she's up to, so I guess everything's okay. So I'm really concluding here, and I think I'm almost at my hour. Almost an hour, I know. It is actually one more minute. And my slide says conclusion, so we'll be okay. The diamond jewelry industry is coming under extreme pressure from internet technology. It's fundamentally disrupting the supply chain and the way consumers learn about and buy products. Think about that, what that means for you. We must identify and segment our added value propositions to remain profitable. If we do not change, innovative technology will push us out of business. We must change. You know, President Trump is just blowing up all of Washington, changing everything for the sake of change. But that's, you know, maybe crazy change, but we must change. That is the only thing I can guarantee you. If you don't change your business model in light of everything that's going on, you know, you're going to get to be toast. Radical change in the political and economic environment are expected. It is likely the U.S. will experience significant growth. I'm looking good here for you guys. An increased demand for Jewish, the new fiscal economic incentives, that's $1 billion, suggested by their parents be implemented. So if they do this plan, which I think they will do, $1 trillion, trillion, not billion, trillion, then that's going to be good for the jewelry sector. The outlook for U.S. diamond demand is extremely positive. If and only if the diamond trade proactively, you know, ping, here you should be pinging, proactively embraces change and meets the emotional needs not just the, I want to buy a diamond, the emotional and social demands not even needs of a rapidly growing cons uh, you know, consumer base. So our world around us is changing. We ourselves are changing. 
Um, and uh, I must say that uh, I, I don't know because I usually speak to people. I get some feedback. So I don't know what's going on. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. I don't know if questions are possible with this technology that we're using today in the Zoom. But whatever it is, um, I, I am very happy to have this opportunity. And look, guys, call me. Um, you know, hang out with Rappaport people. Um, let us know who you are. Um, I think that I want to develop relationships with people like you guys. You AGS guys, you're great. You're the future. And you're young. And you're dynamic. And, you know, I love the AGS of values and, and the way we think. And I, we've got to figure out how we're going to actually get in this business and not get Amazon. But, you know, still in all, um, this approach that I recommended today, I hope uh, some of you find it helpful. And if you do, send me an email. And, you know, Panina's hanging out with you guys also lately. That's my daughter, Panina Rappaport. So, yeah, I would be very happy to have better relationships with uh, with the uh, the young uh, millennials, or they call you the young whatever, uh, of the of the AGS. So thank you all. And I, I hand this back over to the monitor, maybe, if there is a question and answer capability. And if not, I wish you well. Uh, from uh, the holy city, nice city of Jerusalem. I can't wave to you. You can't see me. I am waving. <laughs>